Hi, with this video, I want to derive an impulse response function for our kind of classic single degree of freedom damped oscillator that we use in much of structural dynamics, just to think through um, how this thing is defined and uh, how we might derive it in other situations as well. Okay, so we're going to look at the system uh, kind of illustrated by this figure below. So we've got this kind of fixed support on the left. There's a spring with a stiffness k, and then there's a damper um, that's velocity dependent with a damping coefficient c. And then there's a mass m, and the, we're measuring the displacement x of t of that mass. All right? And then that whole um, system can be excited by uh, f of t. And here now we've got a couple ways we can define the, the excitation. So in this case, we're going to define um, f of t as an acceleration. And that acceleration of the, um, you know, you could think about that like a ground acceleration or something like that. Um, uh, but I'm going to transform that to P of t over m. Or P of t is a force. So we, we can define this in terms of a kind of excitation um, in, of an, in the form of an acceleration or an excitation in the form of a force. So I'm going to write this differential equation up top with this force P of t, and then we'll quickly transform it to the F of t in a, in a moment. Yep, so we've got this force F, P of t on the right, and then on the left we've got the mass multiplied by the excitation of the system, x double dot. Uh, so that's a you know, force equals mass times acceleration term. Then we've got this velocity proportional damping, so c times x dot, so c times the velocity of the system generates a damping force. And then k times x is the spring force, where, where k is the stiffness of that spring. Okay, so this equality has to hold. So we've got this second order differential equation, because we've got two derivatives of x. And we need to figure out what x of t is. And specifically in this uh, video, we want to think about what's x of t if p of t is a impulse, um, a direct delta impulse. Okay, so that's our setup. Uh, and as yeah, we want to know what is this impulse response function for this system. Okay, so let's get started. So our strategy, we're going to first rearrange that differential equation a little bit, and then we're going to substitute it in uh, an impulse. So first line here, I just have that same equation from the previous slide rewritten. We're going to rearrange a little bit. We're going to take this, this mass, and we're going to divide both sides by m. So now the left term, uh, the acceleration term, has no, no coefficient in front of it. Um, so that simplifies our life a little bit. And the rest of the terms all have an m in the denominator now. So um, and right, so we can then say also on the left-hand side, because this is a p of t over m, that's also equal to that f of t that we defined on the previous slide. Right. So we've got um, f of t is, is an equivalent. Uh, so just to track our, our notation here is a p of t over m, so that we could think about that like a base acceleration. And so if the base accelerates, that's going to create an inertial force, um, you know, equivalent to the, you know, proportional to the mass of the system. Then we're going to convert that uh, second equation into standard form, where we uh, make some change of variables. So the first change of variable we're going to make is we're going to substitute in an omega naught, and that's equal to the square root of k over m. And so that's um, what we call the undamped frequency. So that's the, the, f the circular frequency at which the system would, would oscillate back and forth um, if it was not damped. And we'll see that omega naught shows up as a term in our solution of how the system responds. So we've got that substituted in in a couple points. And then we also have a, a Greek letter zeta. And that's equal to c over 2m omega naught. And this is what we call the damping ratio. So this is a, a, it measures kind of the fraction of da the, the damping is a fraction of what we call the critical damping ratio, where the solution of the um, response of the system would change if that damping ratio gets bigger than one. But if it's less than one, we, we have kind of a, um, a fixed solution to this differential equation. Okay? So we can substitute that in um, where we have the C term. So we would have like a, um, an m omega naught 
left over there. So we've got the, the omega naught still sitting here. The m disappeared because it was in the denominator before. So the c over m part falls into that zeta, and we're left with the 2 in the omega naught from this zeta definition here. Then where we had a k over m before, we've got a omega naught squared now in this standard form. Okay, So we've simplified this down a bit. I've got no coefficient on the right-hand side or on the acceleration term. And then in the middle, we just have omega naught and zeta as our two remaining coefficients that kind of rolled up the other coefficients from the initial problem statement. Okay, So this is our standard form of our differential equation. It's, it's equivalent to the original one. We just swapped around some variable names a little bit. Now we're going to take that f of t and say, what if that um, forcing of the system was the direct delta? And then in that case, x is going to be um, this impulse response function. So if we put the direct delta on the right-hand side, we can solve this differential equation and figure out what that h of x must be. Okay, So that's our next step here. So we've now um, substituted in the direct delta on this slide. So that's our, that's our forcing. And now we've substituted in the impulse response function. on the left-hand side. And, and I guess implicit in all these differential equations was that on the previous slides, x is a function of t. Here, h of x is a function of t as well. Uh, I've just omitted it for a kind of brevity of the um, writing the equation. But we, you know, we're still taking time derivatives of this thing. It's, it's varying in time. The dots are indicating the first and second time derivatives of um, this time-varying function. OK, so that's our differential equation we're going to try to solve. We're also going to, you know, we have to set some initial conditions in order to, to solve this thing um, for a fixed answer. So what we're going to say is that um, immediately before time 0, the system is at rest. Okay? So um, we're going to say the impulse response function at time negative epsilon. And we're just going to let epsilon go to 0. So right up until time 0, the displacement of the system is 0. And then right up until time 0, from the, from the negative side, the velocity of the system is zero as well. Okay, So that'll set some initial conditions that'll let us find a, a fixed answer to this thing. So everything's at rest for time less than time zero. And then right at time zero, we're going to hit the system with this impulse response function and let it start um, responding. And then we'll, that'll let us solve for this impulse response function. Okay, So um, one and then one additional um, constraint we can put in here based on those initial conditions is that right, Newton tells us that force is equal to mass times acceleration and the P of T is our force in this case so P of T over M or, which is also the F of T um, that so let's, I guess we can write that's F of T T, which is in, in our case is the um, Dirac delta function, that's equal to the acceleration. So the, the acceleration of this impulse response function um, has to be equal to this Dirac delta. And this is all at right at t equals 0. Right? So up Prior to t equals 0, the system was all at rest. There was no force or anything like that. Right at t equals 0, we apply this force, delta t. And that's got to be equal to the acceleration of the system. Force equals mass times acceleration. Okay. Um, let's see. So, the, so the, let me see. So this is yeah. force divided by mass equals acceleration. I guess there's a way to say that. OK, so that's a, that's a condition we've got. So now what we're going to do is try to figure out uh, the form of this impulse response function. So the first thing we can do is we can integrate the uh, impulse response function. So we'll say that, and we're going to do this kind of for very small increments in time. So the limit as epsilon goes to 0 of the integral from minus, uh, not minus infinity, minus epsilon to positive epsilon of this Dirac delta function dt has to be equal to 
the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, integral from minus epsilon to epsilon, so same limits of the um, impulse response function acceleration. So we said right at, right at time equals zero, that direct delta has to be equal to the acceleration of the system. And we're, so we're going to take this integral, but we're going to let epsilon go to zero. So we're just thinking about that instant right around um, the time equals zero where the system kicks off. Okay? So this helps us because we know that the integral on the left-hand side is one. We, that, was, that exact equation was in our definition of the direct delta function. Now the right-hand side, let's, let's play with this for a second. So the integral of acceleration is velocity. So I can, when I evaluate that integral, I'm going to get to h dot x of t, the, the velocity of the impulse response function. I'm going to evaluate that between minus epsilon and epsilon. And I'm going to take the whole thing, the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. Evaluating that a little bit more. So if I have, um, let's keep the limit there for one more line. So the limit as epsilon goes to zero of, uh, like, I guess we could keep the, the time parameter in the previous line here. So we're looking at h dot x evaluated at epsilon minus h dot x evaluated at minus epsilon. Okay, and then so the second term is pretty easy because that's um, right before um, time before anything happens, right? And so that the velocity at negative time is equal to zero. Um, so all we have is the the velocity at time epsilon um, as as epsilon approaches zero. Okay, so. Um, then we're going to use conservation of momentum to think this one over here. So let's make a little remark. Um, well, I guess, let's see. Uh, sorry, let's, let's rewrite this first, and then I'll talk about conservation of momentum. So we can say that the limit, I'll just switch the left, hand right, left and the right-hand sides here for our final line. So the limit as epsilon goes to 0 of the, the velocity from the impulse response function, that has to equal 1. Okay. So the velocity is one, kind of at this instant right after, oops, at this instant right after time equals one. So it's the impulse response function evaluated at, at positive epsilon. Okay, and this is coming from conservation of momentum. All right, so that's conservation of momentum is saying a force times some increment in time, delta t, is going to equal the mass times the change in velocity. Right. Or equivalently, we can write the force divided by the mass multiplied by an increment in time is equal to the change in velocity. Okay. And in our case, the, the force divided by the mass is the, the direct delta and multiplied by this very small increment in time, right? And then kind of the, the force over mass times the increment in time, that's the integrating out to one that we got from the, the integral of the impulse response function. And that has to equal how much the velocity changed. So um, the, the velocity has to change by this unit of one. OK, and then let's do one more integral to get to the displacement as a function of time. So first, we're going to do this in two ways. We'll say the limit as epsilon goes to 0, same integral from minus epsilon to positive epsilon. But now we're going to integrate the um, velocity So what, what is that? Let's just try to evaluate this. So this is the, the limit as epsilon goes to 0 of the displacement. So the integral of velocity is displacement. Um, 
and we're just going to jump straight to evaluating it at the limits. So I'm going to evaluate it at positive epsilon minus evaluating it at the lower limit at minus epsilon. Okay, so I jumped straight from velocity to displacement with the integral, and then I evaluated at my upper and lower limits. Okay, and then we know at time negative epsilon, the displacement is equal to zero. Nothing's, at, nothing's moving until time zero. So on one hand, I know that the, this integral is equal to the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the displacement at time epsilon. Okay, and I'm gonna take that same integral and look at it in a different way. Okay, so my second case Let's say the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the same integral, it's from minus epsilon to epsilon of h dot x of t dt. Okay, that's the limit um, as epsilon goes to zero. But here, instead of evaluating the, um, the integral just yet, I'm going to split that integral in half. So first I'm gonna take the integral from minus epsilon up to time zero, and then I'm additionally gonna take the, the integral from zero up to epsilon, okay? And both of these will be a dt, okay? So just split the, the limits of integration in half instead of doing all this in one um, uh, step. I'm just gonna go from minus epsilon to zero and then zero to positive epsilon. And then the question is what is this velocity uh, over those intervals, right? So the velocity from time minus epsilon up to time zero, that's equal to zero, right? There's no movement. The system's up at rest until time zero. So we know this side, that, that for that first half of the time interval we're looking at, the velocity is zero. On the second half, right, we saw that from the previous slide that for epsilon um, that's positive, that this velocity is equal to one, right, from that conservation of momentum. So the direct delta implied a, or Im, imposed a velocity of one on the system. So from time zero to time epsilon, this is equal to one, right? And that, that one was true as epsilon goes to zero, but I'm, I've, I've got that same limit here, so I'm gonna keep thinking about that. Okay, so now I've got just a constant inside my integral. So um, the integral of zero is zero. So I'm, I'm gonna get a, oh, let's see, let's keep the limit copied over here before I start talking. So the integral of zero is just gonna be zero. And then the limit, uh, or the integral of one is gonna be x evaluated, or, or t, I guess, because I'm integrating with respect to t, evaluated at epsilon minus t evaluated at zero. So I'm gonna end up with an epsilon out of this one, right? Or another way to think about it, I've got its function, it's, I'm evaluating over a, a distance of epsilon horizontally and a height of one, so the area is equal to epsilon, okay? And then, this is the limit, so, so the stuff inside the brackets is equal to epsilon, so the value of epsilon as epsilon goes to zero <laughs> is zero, right? Okay, and, and the reason why that's happening is that there's not enough time, or there's no time to respond, right? If I, if I integrate this velocity over this infinitesimal er, interval of time, even though I've got kind of a velocity of one for this very short period of time, it's not enough to accumulate any displacement. So my instantaneous displacement's gotta be zero, right? I can't, I can't have a non-zero displacement if I started at zero and I just applied a force. Um, so that's where we, where we get to, okay? So, um, oh, sorry, well, so this, this this integral is all equal to zero. Maybe I'm jumping to conclusions here. Now what I want to do is I want to equate um, this zero with this um, result from the top integral. And so now I, what I can write is that um, taking those two together, maybe I'll just leave it in blue. I could, equating those two, I can write the limit as epsilon goes to zero. of the displacement 
from this impulse response function, that's got to be equal to zero. Okay, and that's what I was starting to talk about here with this no time to respond. Okay, so I know that the the impulse response function displacement is equal to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so that gives us some uh, some boundary conditions on this impulse response function and its behavior. Um, so we've, uh, we can kind of summarize what we've got so far. So I've got the, um, the standard form of my differential equation, substituting in the impulse response function and its derivatives, and the direct delta for the excitation. And now we have those boundary conditions from the previous slides, right? So the velocity is equal to one, right at zero, slightly positive of zero. And the displacement is equal to zero because I don't have any time to respond with that, that finite velocity. Okay. okay. So that gives us our, uh, our, our form and our boundary conditions that specifies uh, how h of x and its derivative are behaving at time zero. So now what we can do is we can look at the general solution for that differential equation. So the general solution, and this is true for zeta less than one, right, where that, that's that damping coefficient that we talked about. So if, so if zeta gets bigger than one, this, the solution changes. But um, the general solution is that this impulse response function is going to be e to the minus zeta omega naught t multiplied by c1 cosine omega dt plus c2 sine omega d. Okay, and these omega d's we just uh, introduced here, so let's define that. So omega d is omega naught, the undamped frequency, um, multiplied by the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Okay, and this is what we call the damped frequency. Right, and so we can see that right, this is a damped system. Um, and, and then that frequency is, is showing up in the cosine and sine term. So this is basically how fast the, the system is oscillating back and forth between positive and negative responses. Um, and so a couple of things we can see is that if, if that zeta is equal to zero, so if, and that's equivalent to the damping coefficient c equaling zero, then omega d equals omega naught. So omega naught is the frequency when there's no damping, right? And then when zeta is positive, you know, when zeta is positive, we get a, a frequency here that's slightly smaller than the undamped frequency. So it, it vibrates slightly slower. We can also see that if zeta gets to be equal to one, then we end up with a, a, a zero here and, and the equation um, I guess the, um, the, that'll work okay. We'll get a cosine of zero and a sine of zero. If, if zeta gets bigger than one, we end up with an imaginary number here and the, if things break down, there's a different equation uh, functional form for that case, okay? So we call that an overdamped system. But let's assume we have kind of a, um, a zeta much less than one. That's typical for structural systems we study, right? With typical zetas are kind of less than 0.1 for lots of systems we look at. Um, Okay, and, and, and one other note, I guess, is that this functional form that's written down here, right, so this is a type of equation that we just look up. I'm, I'm used to this, you take differential equations uh, once and figure out how these um, equations work. And then there's a set of standard solutions like this that show up depending on the form of the differential equation up here. So this is just a classic equation that we look up. What we do need for our specific system here is um, we have to solve for a couple constants, right? So there's a constant C1, and a constant C2. So we have to solve for these. And we can do that, or I'll say solve for these constants. We can do that using our initial conditions. And then everything else is specified. So the, um, the zeta, the omega naught, and the omega d are all specified out of the differential equation, right? So we've got the zeta and the omega naught sitting in the equation, the properties of the system. And omega d is just a, a variable that's related to those other two variables in the differential equation. Okay, 
So now we just have to plug in boundary conditions and we're almost uh, finished here. So let's plug in boundary conditions. So the first one that we'll do is the displacement boundary condition, since we already on the slide have an equation for displacement. So I can say this displacement at time zero is equal to zero. And so I'm gonna take the um, this equation here and I'm just gonna substitute it in t equals zero. So in this first term out front, I'm gonna have e to the zero, which is equal to one. And then in the square bracket terms here, right, I'm gonna have a C1 will come along and I'll have a cosine of zero. So no matter what eight omega D, omega D is, um, it's gonna be multiplied by zero. Cosine of zero is equal to one. So I'm gonna have a C1 times one from the cosine term. And then the C2 will come along and I'll have a sine of zero and sine of zero is zero. So I'll have C2 times zero uh, it, so that's the, the value of this function at time zero. Okay, and that whole thing is equal to C1. That's the only thing that's remaining. So therefore, C1 has got to equal zero in order for the displacement to equal zero at time zero. Okay, so that knocks out the cosine term from my solution here. I'm just left with the C2 sine inside the square brackets. So let's take the derivative, and, tr and so we can use the, the derivative con um, initial conditions. So first, just the derivative of the function. So I'll say that the derivative of h of x is, um, so the exponential term, let's take a look at it. The derivative of this term, I'm gonna get a minus zeta omega naught out front, and then I'll keep the exponential term. So we'll get minus zeta omega naught e to the minus zeta omega naught t. And then we'll just keep the term in the square brackets. C2 sine omega d t. And the cosine term is gone because C1 is equal to zero, we know. Okay, so that's the derivative of the first term times the second term in the square brackets. Now we have to add a term, which is leave the first term alone, the e to the minus zeta omega naught t. And now we'll take the derivative of the term in the square brackets. So the C2 is a constant. The derivative of sine is cosine. And then I'm gonna have to take the derivative of the thing inside of the cosine. So I'm gonna get an omega d out front for the derivative of the, of the argument with respect to t. So I've got a C2 omega d cosine omega d t. Okay, so that's the equation for the derivative of the impulse response function. It's got that C2 constant in there. I'm trying to solve for that. So let's plug in our boundary condition. So we'll say the derivative at time zero is equal to one. That's equal to what we get if we plug in t equals zero into that above formula. So I've got a minus zeta omega naught times e to the zero, which is one. And then my, inside my square brackets, I've got a c2 times a sine of zero, which is zero. Okay. And then for the second line, I've got an e to the zero, which is one. And then inside my square brackets, I've got C2 omega D cosine of zero, which is one. Okay, so this, because I've got a zero here on the first term, that whole thing is gonna go to zero. And all I'm left with is the C2 omega D. And so that means that, uh, so that's, and that's equal to one. So therefore, C2 equals one over omega D. Okay. 
Okay, so that substitutes in for the C2, and now we have no more unknown constants in the equation. So uh, here on the next slide, we don't have it. Um, I've got it kind of pre-written out. The, we've got the, um, the one over omega d, that was the C2 um, constant we just solved for. We've got the e to the minus zeta omega naught t. Right, that's been floating along in our solution the whole way. Then we've got the sine omega dt. We don't have a cosine omega dt term anymore because the, the constant on that was equal to zero. Okay? So that is our general solution for the impulse response function for this system. Okay, um, and so what, what we see is there's kind of two components to it. There's a, there's a leading constant out front, the omega d. Um, it's not particularly interesting for us now, but it's important in the numerical solutions. But we have this e uh, exponential term here, so it's, it's decaying. As t gets bigger, the number in parentheses is going to get bigger because zeta and omega naught are just constants. So as that gets bigger, the e to the bigger negative number is smaller. And that's what's giving us uh, on this plot. Down here below, I've got this an impulse response plunk function plotted for a zeta of 0.05, so kind of a lightly damped system. So what this exponential term is giving us is this dashed line, the envelope of the response. And then we have the sine omega dt. This is an oscillatory response. So that's the, um, the sine function inside of the oscillations. So what we see is that if I, if I hit this system with an impulse, right, it's starting at displacement zero. It does have an instantaneous acceleration from the, um, the force imparted by that uh, impulse. It has a velocity of one. Displacement starts at zero and goes up, and then it starts oscillating around. So it's right, if I hit it, it's kind of vibrating back and forth. But because of the damping, it's decaying over time. The amplitude of each oscillation gets a little smaller and a little smaller and kind of trends towards uh, zero. Okay, and then if uh, we can think about this function as well, that um, when zeta is equal to zero, so that's when we have no damping present, then that um, exponential term is going to go to one, right? I'll have e to the zero, so it's just equal to one, and the impulse response function is just going to be one over omega d times um, sine omega dt. Okay, so what we'll get is just oscillations. There's no envelope that's decaying. Or equivalently, the envelope just stays constant at one. All right, so we'll just get a sine function that just oscillates back and forth forever. If there's no damping in the system, there's nothing to kind of dissipate any of this energy, so it'll just continue on. So there's undamped response, no decay. Okay, so that's kind of our classic uh, impulse response function. If we've got a system that looks like that uh, mass with a dash pot and a spring that we uh, started off this video with, this is our impulse response function that we can use to solve for dynamic response to systems. If we've got a different system with a different governing differential equation, we can just go through this process again to rederive the impulse response function that's relevant for that system. Okay, so that's it for this video.